and welcome to this episode of the Spirit of Texas Author Spotlight. I'm Lauren Scott, Chair of the Spirit of Texas Reading List Committee, and in this episode, we are excited to welcome Spirit of Texas 2024 honoree Jasmine Mendez, author of the middle grade novel and verse, Aniana Del Mar Jumps In. Welcome, Jasmine. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. We are excited to have you here today. And so to introduce Jasmine, I'm going to go ahead and read her biography for everybody who's watching. So Jasmine Mendez is a Dominican-American award-winning author of several books for children and adults. She is also a poet, playwright, translator, and professional audiobook narrator. Her most recent publication, Aniana Del Mar Jumps In, a novel in verse about a young girl diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis, received star re reviews from Kirkus Reviews, Publishers Weekly, School Library Journal, and others. Her YA memoir, Islands Apart, Becoming Dominican American, and her debut poetry collection, City Without Altar, were recently recognized with honors and awards by the Texas Institute of Letters. And her debut pitch picture book, Josefina's Habituelas, was the 2022 Writers League of Texas Children's Book Discovery Prize winner. You have a lot going on, Jasmine. <laughs> Yes, yes, I do. Um, yes, it's been a busy couple of years. Um, I don't know that it's slowing down anytime soon, but uh, I love what I do and I'm incredibly lucky to be able to do it uh, and to share these stories with with the world. So I'm just I'm very excited and happy that I get to keep writing books. So. Well, we love them and we want them <laughs> to keep coming and we'll talk about that more later on. But before we get started, before we jump into our questions, um, we may have some viewers who have not had a chance to read Aniana Del Mar Jumps In yet, um, which is, of course, all those honors I listed, all those starred reviews, but also on our spot list this year um, is a fantastic book. Will you tell us a little bit about it to start? Yes, Aniana Del Mar Jumps In um, is, first of all, it's set in Galveston, Texas, uh, which is one of my favorite places on earth, uh, and especially in Texas. And she's a young Dominican-American swimmer. Um, she loves the water. She loves to swim. Um, her father encourages swimming. They attend swim meets and swim practices at the YMCA. He takes her to the beach um, to swim, and she absolutely loves the water. Um, however, her mom is, uh, due to some earlier uh, childhood traumas, deathly afraid of the water and is very sort of overprotective of Aniana and doesn't want her near the water. Um, well, her secret comes out um, uh, after a swim meet uh, when Aniana gets very sick, starts feeling very ill. Um, and throughout the course of the book, you find out or she is diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, and the rest of the story is really about Aniana trying to get back to the thing that she loves the most, trying to get back to the water, learning how to manage her illness and disability, um, and, and trying to gain some bodily autonomy um, and control over, over what happens to her body and what she's able to do. Because, um, you know, she's got her parents telling her one thing and her doctors telling her something else. And her own desire right to want to to get better or to feel stronger and to get back to doing the thing that she loves and so it's a story about family about mothers and daughters fathers and daughters um siblings as well she's got a little brother whom she adores um and friendship a best friend um and so it's about all of those things and how um chronic illness and disability can come in and yes definitely change and impact our lives um but how we grow and live and learn and work through that change and transformation um to come out being the person um, that, that we're meant to be, I think, um, in, in different ways. And so yeah, it's a story about so many things um, that, that are very close to my heart. And I just hope that, that others can kind of um, feel connected to it as well. Well, I think they definitely do. I mean, there's so many, like you said, so many themes in here that any reader can connect to. Mm -hmm. And one of our first questions is actually about the father-daughter, mother-daughter connection. And I realized just now, I forgot to show, this is the cover of our book. Um, with the orange trees that she talks mm -hmm. about growing in her front yard in the book that her dad planted the day she was born. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see um, on the cover that Aniana, you can see her, um, the red patches that she talks mm -hmm. about in the book. And so I love this cover too, because it, you know, especially with our middle grade readers, they still need a little bit of a visual sometimes. And yes. this really does give you such a great picture of who Ani is in the story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cover. thank Happy you. Yeah, the cover was uh, designed by Gabby D'Alessandro, who um, has done a number of covers, but she's a Dominican American artist. And so I was very particular. I was like, it needs to be. I would love Gabby if she wants to do it. Um, and she said yes. And I just love all the little details. I don't know if you noticed too down near the bottom, there's a mom dolphin and a baby dolphin. Oh, oh yeah. 
in the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's the moon, the orange trees, the water. She picked up on so many elements, even the heart shaped mole or birthmark on her forehead mm -hmm. that's described there. So I just thought all the details were beautiful um, that are captured uh, in such a small amount of space. So mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it really does. And it really entices having like, even if you haven't know nothing about this book you don't even look at the back like you look at this and you're like this is a middle school girl I can connect with this like yeah. I love that yeah um such a great cover so of course I love the covers <laughs> you know kids judge them by that they so you gotta, yeah they do they do about. well it's so funny because when it first came out it was it was a lot of librarians and educators are like oh I love that you wrote a sports book and I was like I wasn't really trying to write a sports book, you know, but they see that they see Ani in the bathing suit and they, you know, associate it with swimming, obviously, mm -hmm. and that a lot of young, young girl swimmers and, and you know, athletes uh, that are swimmers see that and they're like, oh, it's a book about swimming, you know, and they get excited. And I was like, oh, I wasn't trying to write a, a sports book, but I guess I did. <laughs> so <laughs> I never thought about it the way, yeah, it does fall yeah. into the sports category. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> I love that. Okay, well, so going back to the parents and kind of that relationship here, um, one of the most powerful parts of Aniana Del Mar Jefferson is the way that her father acknowledges her bodily autonomy to push herself too far in swim practices and in races. And he gives her that space to deal with the physical consequences of that. And so mm -hmm. kind of thinking about that, why was it important to you as an author to show that side of living with a disability or chronic illness? Yeah, I mean, I think because it's something that it took me a long time myself. So I, I myself have a, have a variety of chronic illnesses um, and identify as someone um, who lives with disability. And but it took me, you know, way into um, my journey into chronic illness to kind of um, speak up for myself and to have that bodily autonomy. I was very much like, well, whatever the doctors say, and maybe even whatever my parents think is what I should do. That's what I should do. I'm a very big rule follower and sort of, um, you know, I'm, I'm a good girl, if you will, people pleaser. Um, and I wanted to give Ani some traits and, and some things that I, that took me a long time to get to and to have and to own for myself. Um, and, and I think that it was important for her to have someone in her life that, that gave her that ability to to kind of do um, to what she wanted with her body to push herself in that way because she knew her body best, you know. Um, and I think that there were so many other voices in the mix that are trying to tell her, no, you need to do this. This is the right thing to do, kind of, and keeping her in that sort of box or that zone of you're a kid and we're adults and we know what's best for you. But she's not so little anymore, right? And she's the one experiencing this pain and she's the one experiencing what she is able to do and not able to do and learning for herself on a day to day basis, because I think that's what people don't realize too, right? With with some chronic illnesses and invisible illnesses or invisible disabilities, if you will. Um, that your your day to day can look different and what you could do one day may vary from what you could do the next day or if you push yourself too hard, then guess what the next day you may be in bed, you may be in bed for a few days right if you have a really good, good day and you do all the things in one day, then you may, you know, be bedridden or really fatigued and tired and achy for two or three days after that. And so it's something that I think most of us who are diagnosed with a, a chronic illness or something that that has body aches and fatigue and sort of varying levels of, of ability and disability um, struggle with, especially early on. Um, and I think that um, she herself had to kind of figure out uh, what her limits are and what her limits were, um, and her family too. Um, you know, I struggled with that a little bit at the beginning where I remember the first time, a little personal anecdote, the first time I got a shower seat because I literally just could not stand in the shower anymore. My mom was like, do you really need that? You don't need that. You're fine. And I was like, no, mom, like I do. Like it's, it's tiresome to just stand and shower. And I think that was one of the moments that it like hit my own mom personally of like, whoa, okay, this really is something that's that's a struggle that's a real struggle because on the outside we can look fine we can look like oh like a normal quote unquote healthy person nothing's wrong with us you know um but inside like things ache and hurt and are hard and are difficult um and i think sometimes for the people around us it can be hard to to really fully understand that um and so i think it was important for me to to show ani learning how to manage that and then showing how the people in her in her life around her also um, either do or don't give her some of that that autonomy to decide for herself how much she she can do or how much she can push herself or not um, and I think it's a lesson right for for especially for, for young teens and tweens um, of, of being able to speak up and, and say no or say I want to do this or I can't do this or you know and as a parent now that I'm a mom like allowing your child to kind of 
see for themselves if they can push themselves that far and fail and you having to hold back and be like, all right, I don't think it's a good idea, but I'm going to let you do it. You know, it's hard. And so I think, I think it can open up some wonderful discussion between, um, you know, care caregivers and, and children and, and young people for sure. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I, I reread the book recently, mm -hmm. um, just this weekend, and there was a part in it now that you're speaking to that, where she had a really great day. And then her dad mm -hmm. takes her fishing with her little brother. Mm -hmm. And she's having this internal dialogue of like, he doesn't realize that standing, standing on that pier or sitting on mm -hmm. that pier is going to make me feel really bad, but I have to do it because like, he wants to do this with me. And mm -hmm. that's when she's first sort of starting to figure it out. And mm -hmm. it's such a great point because I think a lot of us walk around and we don't see other people having those issues or we judge them when we see them having that moment. And, mm -hmm. you know, we all need to have a little bit more acceptance and kindness and you know, being a parent's a great example too. That was a yeah. fantastic example <laughs> of that. So I, and I definitely think that, think that theme carries through and is accessible for all readers. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that theme being in the book because it's such an important theme of acceptance and empathy and understanding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and, and trying to like understand things that maybe we, we can't even see, right? Or again, I go back to that idea of like, we're parents, we know best or we're the adults and, and we know best. And it's like, but you're not living inside her body. You know, it's like, you don't know even if she looks okay, right? Or she's not running a fever. I think those were some of the early signs for my parents. Like, well, but but you look fine. Or, oh, you're you're not running a fever. You're okay. Or you were walking yesterday. Why can't you get up and do things today? And it's like, that was yesterday. <laughs> today is a different day. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, our next question kind of plays off of her parents again. And it, you've mm -hmm. talked about this a little bit, but um, both of her parents love her, and, but they show their love in very different ways. So her mm -hmm. dad gives her this independence. He's pushing her, you know, Prior to her diagnosis, he's pushing her as a swimmer and her mom is very protective and mm -hmm. kind of thinking about our middle schoolers who are, you know, specifically the age group reading this book. Um, what advice would you give them if they're struggling with a parent who doesn't understand them as too protective or maybe mm -hmm. even too hands off? Like what advice would you give them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know it can be hard. I know I struggled with this a lot uh, in my teen and tween years, uh, middle grade years of just speaking up for yourself and just saying like, hey, mom and dad, can we have this conversation? Or hey, you know, parent, whoever, whoever sort of the caregiver there um, and, and trying to say, this is what I'm feeling right now, or this, this is how I feel when this happens, right? Um, and just trying to open up those lines of communication in whatever way feels safe. Sometimes, you know, maybe um, it doesn't feel super safe at first or they don't have that kind of open communicative relationship with the, you know, caregiver in their life or the adult in their life. Um, and maybe in that case, you know, finding an adult that they can talk to, because that's what I ended up having to do is finding an adult at my school that I could talk to that then would kind of work as a mediator between me and my parent, you know, um, to kind of allow for the, that communication to, to open up um, and, and to start that dialogue um, because they can't know how you feel unless you say something about it, right? Not, not all parents are great about being sort of there and intuitive and asking you and trying to drag it out of you. Um, you know, or if you yourself have been kind of quiet for a long time, you don't express yourself a lot. Um, maybe they don't know that anything's wrong or that you have a problem with the way that they are kind of parenting you, if they're being overprotective or if they're being hands-on. Um, you know, I found sometimes that um, with my dad in particular in high school, I would just email him. I'm such a better writer than I am a speaker sometimes. And so when I wanted something or needed something, I would just kind of send him an email. And I found that that was really helpful um, to communicating with him. So, um, you know, again, I think it comes to finding a way to speak with them directly um, or, or finding another adult that you can confide in that then can maybe serve as the, the intermediary between you and that parent in a way that, that helps you express yourself, I think. Um, you know, and, and, and helping them see, you know, I think it's hard as for any parent to watch their child grow up and become independent and want to do things on their own without them. Um, and just kind of finding a way to, to maybe negotiate, right, the terms of that independence, if you will, just saying, okay, well, um, you know, I can't do X, Y, and Z, but can maybe I do this much, right, and just trying to slowly, you know, gain some, some of that, you know, autonomy and, and independence um, in little ways. Um, but I think, you know, as, as a kid, you also have to kind of do your part, like show that you're responsible and mature and you're able to handle more independence or more responsibilities or, or liberties um, also. And so just think like reflect on yourself, like, have I done what I needed to do to like have a not overprotective parent or, you know, um, and, you know, I think that's a skill that, that many of us still kind of, <laughs> uh, it takes a while to, to learn and to be self-reflective like that. But, um, but yeah, I definitely think that communication is, is a huge um, part of it. And I know definitely Ani struggles with that, right? There's a lot of internal 
you know, and silencing that she, you know, she's like, oh, and I don't, just, she doesn't know how to say what she wants to say um, sometimes throughout the book. Um, but I think that eventually she does, she does find her voice and is able to speak up for herself. Um, and also, you know, I think, again, might be harder for young people, but knowing that oftentimes there is a strong reason or a personal reason why parents are the way that they are, right? Um, all parents are people too, <laughs> is my motto. Uh, and, and we come with our own baggage, we're human, and, and we come with our own past, you know, that influences the way that we parent. Um, and so just to kind of be mindful of that as best as you can. <laughs> That's great advice. And we do. And you, you see that here in the book where you learn mm -hmm. about her mom and why her mom is so opposed to her swimming. And yeah. I mean, there's a lot of deep seated stuff happening emotionally mm -hmm. for both parents in this mm -hmm. book. And I love that, um, you know, talking about the communication piece that throughout the story, Ani is sort of coaching herself through mm -hmm. that communication piece. It's a great mm -hmm. jumping off point for, for readers mm -hmm. to go, okay, I'm feeling the same way she is and see the steps that she takes to finally mm -hmm. gain that autonomy. So it's, it's almost like a little kind of a how-to guide, <laughs> in a way, which is great because mm -hmm. as a middle schooler and a young adult, even for adults, it's hard to find that way to advocate for yourself. So that's a brilliant theme in this book and one that I think is so powerful and important. So thank you for writing that for a middle <laughs> For sure. For sure. Like I said, it's something, finding my voice is something I struggled with well into adulthood um, and advocating for myself, you know, always believing like, well, they know better, they know best, and I can't say anything. And it's like, but wait a minute, this is my body. Like I should have a say in what happens. So yeah, for sure. Well, and that's why, you know, swimming is such an important thing to her throughout this book. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, she hides for a while from her mom, but her mm -hmm. dad's sort of their little secret, their uh, mm -hmm. daddy daughter dates that dates. they go on where they're <laughs> not really telling mom what they're doing. And yeah. um, cause they know she's not going to approve. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, through the course of that, she, the swimming is a big part of her identity. She talks about like, um, I mean, even her last name is um, you know, Del Mar. Yeah. So, and we know that her parents are, you know, they talk about the island and growing up there. And so swimming is such a big part of her identity. So I'm just curious, um, what are some things that you did or loved um, as a middle schooler, as a young adult, even now that have become a big part of your identity besides being an author, because obviously <laughs> writing is a large part of your identity. <laughs> Yeah, so actually, um, I mean, I've always loved swimming. I wasn't on a competitive swim team or anything like that. Ani is so much more advanced. <laughs> I gave her all the qualities I wish. I was like, man, I wish I could have done swim team. Um, but no, the biggest thing for me in middle and high school and even through college was theater. I was an actress. I was a performer. Um, I loved performing. I loved being on stage. I loved theater. Um, and so it formed so much of all of my identity. I mean, I went to school and I studied theater. I taught theater. Um, I really believed I was going to be on Broadway and win a Tony. I mean, I still could win a Tony for playwriting. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> you know, but, but my dream was to act on Broadway. Um, and so, yeah, it formed a huge part of my identity and a huge part of my life. Um, and just that belief that, that, yeah, that I was going to tell stories through theater. I've ended up doing other things and, and obviously writing and telling stories through through writing books. But um, but performing and acting um, was my first love, was my first sort of entryway into the artistic world, into the storytelling world. Um, and, and even now, you know, now that I, I claim myself as a professional audiobook narrator. <laughs> I've, audio, I've, I've narrated all of two books, uh, but I love it. Um, you know, that's that's how I've kind of dipped my toe back into to the acting world, into the performance world. Um, and I still direct, I still direct plays. And um, I'll let y'all know that Aniana Del Mar jumps in is being adapted into a one act musical. Um, yeah, we're doing it. We're having a reading of it this in May uh, with Stages Theater here in Houston. So um, That's awesome. yeah, it's currently in development. It's in development. So I'm excited about that. Um, yeah, so so theater was one of the things that um, that I've carried with me throughout my whole life. And, and actually my own diagnosis um, of my chronic illness at 22 um, is what kind of drew took me away from it because theater is so physically demanding um, and it's really exhausting and like my body just could not. <laughs> um, and so I had to take a step back from it. And that's really when I immersed myself in my writing was when I couldn't do theater full time anymore. Um, and so I kind of wanted to mirror Ani's struggle with my own in that regard. Hers was with swimming, mine was a theater, but obviously like the diagnosis significantly impacted what she was and wasn't able to do with the things she loved most, right? Um, mm -hmm. I always say that a lot of, um, oftentimes, in most of the books that I write or when I'm thinking about writing, um, it always goes back to the Langston Hughes poem, um, Harlem, which is what happens to a dream deferred. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it stink like rotten meat? 
or does it explode? Um, and so I was just thinking about what happens to a dream deferred, right? You have this dream and then you can no longer do it and kind of how, for me, like losing the ability to do theater was probably one of the greatest losses of my life. Um, you know, I, I haven't had much heartbreak, but I always say like theater, you know, really broke my heart in many ways. And, and I, it was one of the biggest losses that I, that I faced that I had to grieve. And so thinking about, you know, how when you're not able to really do the one thing you're passionate about and how you have to kind of grieve that um, or find your way back to it or figure out something new um, and who you are without this thing, which is another thing that I think Aniana goes through, right? Like, who am I, right? If, if I'm not a swimmer, if I can't swim, um, and how do I get back to, to doing that thing that I love the most? Um, so I definitely related to, to Ani's journey in that way. Well, and what a beautiful thing for you, like personally, that this love, this passion for theater is now coming back around <laughs> based on your writing. Like, yeah, yeah, that seems like a beautiful gift from the universe of like, it all <laughs> kind of like comes back together. And I guess, you know, theater, that being a passion um, and the performing arts probably really helps you translate a story onto the pages because mm -hmm. you can envision it mm -hmm. a little bit differently than maybe mm -hmm. someone like me without a theater background because you can see the scenes playing yes. out. Is that how yeah. it kind of works for you a little bit? Yeah, yeah, which is also why I think novel and verse works really well because you don't need sort of all of, of the, the beautiful prose to describe the setting. Like you just go scene by scene by scene, like flash, here's a scene, flash, here's a scene. And I, again, I, yeah, I picture it that way in my mind, just like a theater show. I'm like, if this were on stage, what would we be seeing? What do we need, you know, what needs to be said? And I think even obviously like the way that the dialogue is written in the book is very much like a play, right? You see the names written and then what they say looks more like, like a theatrical play perhaps than, than sort of standard dialogue in, in a book. And so I think that the novel in verse, um, form and genre, yeah, for, for me, kind of really mirrors the the theatrical, the, the play kind of uh, scenic style. Um, and I always say like in another life, I would have been like a film director and I would have been a filmmaker because um, I do like when I write books, I, I see it as if it were a film in my head. And so I, I kind of write out those scenes in that way. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I love it when it all is able to come to come back together or come back to that. Um, I really never thought that I would come back to the theater like as a playwright. Um, so that's that's been really fun to experience. That is so exciting. And I know that we'll have some friends who will want to make a trip down to Houston to see that because that's <laughs> so exciting. I would love to see it live. That's such a, yeah. a fun translation of what you read because, you know, we all picture mm -hmm. picture it in our minds one way and to see it the way you want it portrayed will be really, really interesting. Yeah. There's been some pretty big changes, I will say. Um, you know, in theater, you can't have as many characters. So that's all I'll say about that. But um, but, but I do like where, where, how, where it's landed so far, as far as an adaptation. So That's so exciting. Well, that is awesome. And I love that you talked about the novel inverse aspect of it. Because to me, writing a novel in verse seems so much more challenging because like you said, there's not as much prose. You're not using, I, I tell students all the time when they're looking at novels in verse, cause we have a large group of students, particularly in my school who love novels in verse. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I tell them all the time, I'm like, think about how difficult it is to portray this in mm -hmm. so many fewer words. Um, and so I guess, like you said, that theater background helps you cause you really focus on the scene by scene. Cause that's always been something yeah. that has fascinated me about writers who can write novels in verse. It seems like yeah. such a bigger challenge. Yeah, no, it's definitely what I'm encountering now with the book I'm working on because it's it's been a journey. Um, and and yeah, I think you know also for me, my first foray into writing was poetry because I do get that question a lot of like, well, why did you decide to write Aniana as a novel in verse and not in prose? Um, and so for me, it was just a natural fit um, because I I also never thought I'd be a fiction writer like ever. I was like, I don't write fiction. I write poems and and I write memoir and that's it. My life is interesting enough. Why I gotta make up stories? <laughs> um, and then like the idea for Aniana came to me during the pandemic and we were on lockdown and I was like why not? Let me do this. Let me follow this sort of muse that's this suddenly struck me. Um, and I needed an escape from reality um, at the time. And it was such a fun book to write. Um, obviously, you know, through the concrete poems, that's where I had the most fun, the shape poems that are in the book. Uh, that was really exciting. And, and it just felt like the right medium and the right genre, not just for me as like a poet, um, but to tell Aniana's story, I think. Um, so you could really get into her mind, into her emotional state, um, using the page as a way to express her feelings, her thoughts, to create images. Um, you know, there's a poem in there that's like a spiral and it kind of requires you to like move the book if you want to really read it. Um, and so I wanted it 
to be like a full body experience because what Aniana is going through is a full body experience. Um, and, and so I wanted it, I wanted the reader to be able to engage in the text in that way. And I definitely felt like poetry um, in verse was, was the best way to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's fantastic. And I love that you talked about the, I know I'm straying from my questions. So I apologize. But, <laughs> it's okay. um, you talked about the concrete poems and that's one of the things that I find so powerful in this book. Mm -hmm. um, like one of them that sticks right out to me is the one that's shaped like the turtle where mm -hmm. she's- um, she's That was my favorite. About, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just so beautiful. And even um, like the fish, when she goes fishing with her dad, which I was talking about when he takes her out, one of the poems in that little scene right there, that act, because they're kind mm -hmm. of, it's kind of written in different acts. Mm -hmm. um, is a fish. And I think that is so engaging and so mm -hmm. different. And for, you know, our, uh oh, sorry, I'm in one of those rooms. Room. I'm one of there those you go. <laughs> we were sitting still for too long. It's okay. <laughs> um, no, but I think for that's such an engaging form of poetry, too. And it's, it's fun for them to see that movement and that shape. And you use mm -hmm. a lot of um, uppercase, lowercase changes mm -hmm. in your words too. There's a lot of dynamic movement in the poems. And I think that that's so powerful and really conveys a lot about Ani in the story, which she's narrating and you see the movement of the words, you really get mm -hmm. a sense of how she feels and what she's trying to convey. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love that you wrote it at first. I, I can't yeah. imagine it as anything else. <laughs> it's just- Yeah, it's yeah. And I'll say, you know, hats off that the idea for the words um, and the change of that, that came from Kwame Alexander's The Crossover. Um, Cause I consumed novels in verse before I ever, you know, decided to write one. And I was also very adamant. I was like, I'm not gonna write a novel in verse because it's what people expect me to write and I'm not gonna do it. And then I was like, I'm writing a novel in verse. So now I know never to say never <laughs> and I just keep my mouth closed. Um, but yeah, I was, I, I was reading that book um, and in thinking again about like what Ani is going through and, and how just me knowing what, you know, these kinds of illnesses can do to the body and, and how loud your pain can feel like inside your body. Like, I don't know another way to express it, but just like, that physical pain can just feel really loud. And I was like, how do I portray that on the page? And I felt like this change in font and moving, you know, the words and, and say, you know, using certain onomatopoeia um, with the, the font size change was like the best way to express like, this is a loud thing, like what's happening inside her um, hurts and, and it feels, you know, really loud um, in, inside the body. And so I, I, I wanted to have fun with the font in that way, which again, not, you can do that in prose, right, for sure. Um, but I felt definitely like poetry lended itself a little bit more to that. Um, and when you see sort of like a word just kind of sitting on the page by itself, all caps, bigger than the rest, and there's white space around it, it's like it really stands out. And so you can really kind of like hear it in, in your, you know, in your mind uh, a little bit more strongly. Um, so yeah, I, I had a lot of fun uh, uh, writing it in verse for sure. Yeah, I think it's the perfect medium for this story. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that I'm an expert, but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I trust your judgment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, we've talked a little bit, some of my questions we've kind of already answered, um, but one that I like, this was one that one of our other committee members um, submitted, and I thought it was such a great one. Um, you know, some disability activists say that they are not themselves disabled, but that the world disables them by not being accessible to people of different needs and abilities. Um, and in what ways can we make our world more accessible and inclusive for people dealing with often invisible disabilities like our character Ani here, who has this arthritis and pain, but the people around her may not know. So what are some ways that we could make the world more accessible for people like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And, you know, I really think, you know, obviously it depends on, on where you are and what spaces you're, you're thinking of. Um, but, you know, I think even a lot of the things that, that exist already um, for, for, uh, for accessibility purposes, whether that's um, the, the push buttons to open doors for you, um, sort of the, the hand washing, the auto hand washing, things like that, or things that you can use your foot versus your hand for, because I most of my disability comes with, with my hands um, and just not being able to like physically grasp things or open things and just like, um, you know, having, I think having more readily uh, accessible spaces that are, that are wider, whether that's for, for wheelchairs or whether that's for walkers or canes or whatnot, um, having those ramps available, right, in different spaces, having more disabled parking spots available. Um, I think reframing our idea of what disability, disability looks like, because um, not all disabilities are visible, um, and just being sort of like more patient and compassionate with each other. I think, um, you know, knowing my, one of my biggest quotes that I always think about is everyone is going through something that 
no one you know knows anything about right we're all going through something and so many of us don't don't talk about those things um and so i think even you know one of the biggest things we can do is just raising awareness right for the different kinds of disabilities that exist um or the, the different kinds of of challenges that people can face um whether that's you know you've got like a colonoscopy bag that no one can see or whether you've got sort of limited mobility in certain ways um and i think just allowing I feel like if the whole world just could slow down, or at least the United States, I don't know how other people live in the world, but I feel like if we all just allowed ourselves to just like take things a little bit more slowly, it would um, allow space for those of us that need more time to get around or to do things or to respond um, to, to things. And, and I do agree. I do agree with that statement, right? That the that it's not so much that it's it's the the world's inability to kind of make things more accessible. Um, is what causes sort of those of us who, who have limitations to um, to feel right or to be disabled or to live with this disability because things just are not made with us in mind, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and what, what, so this is a small thing, but one of my biggest things is like room temperature inside places because the cold can actually exacerbate a lot of symptoms for a lot of people, whether that's um, joint pain. Um, for me, it's a, an illness, a condition called Raynaud's. It makes my fingers really cold and tingly and like I can't use them. Like when my fingers are super cold, like I just can't, they, they hurt so much that I can't use my hands to do things. Um, and in Texas, because we live in such a hot state, mm -hmm. inside they blast the AC up, like there's no tomorrow. So you're freezing inside. And I'm like, if y'all could just, you know, even just something like, if you are in a classroom where you are in a space, like if I were to be able to control the room temperature in my own room temperature, right? Like something like that could be really, could be really helpful, you know, um, in a space where it's just like everyone's gonna live, you know, in this building at 62 degrees. And if you're cold, you're cold, bring a sweater, whatever. Um, so so things like that, I think um just being a little bit more mindful of like individual needs um can help everybody. Um, because even when I when I was a, a new mom and I had a stroller, you know, everywhere and like a kid, like using those ramps was great, right? Or or being able to like push the button to open the door for me so that I wouldn't have to like struggle with the stroller and getting the door open. It was like, just push, you know, push the little disabled button and it opens for me and great, like automatic doors, you know, those kinds of things um, can help everybody, you know, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, and I like that you talked about the, um, the cold, cause that was one of the things that I caught in my brain when I was rereading Aniana mm -hmm. this weekend is that she goes to church with her mother, mm -hmm. um, which the religion is a big um, mm -hmm. theme in this book too. Um, mm -hmm. Because her mother's very, very religious and her yes. father is not as yeah. his, his religion is a little different mm -hmm. um, or his spirituality. And of yeah. course her, her madrina's spirituality yeah. is also different. There's <laughs> lots of different representations of that in the story, but um, she goes to church with her mom and she talks about how she's in so much pain because it's mm -hmm. so cold in the church and it's mm -hmm. making her hands hurt and her hips hurt and mm -hmm. her knees hurt from kneeling. And it's like, when I was reading that, I kept thinking like, oh my gosh, like I would never think about that. But now it, mm -hmm. it brings so much awareness to that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would never think about the automatic soap dispensers and paper towel things being helpful to people mm -hmm. who have differing abilities. Mm -hmm. You know, to us, it's just a convenient way to not spread germs. Yeah. Yeah. No, but for <laughs> me, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But for other people, it's like a lifesaver and can really help their accessibility to things. So I love that mm -hmm. you spoke to that. because That's such an important thing for us to keep in mind when we're like, cause mm. you never know what someone else is going through. So yeah, yeah I, I really think that that's so important. Um, okay. Next question. <laughs> I love that. Um, all right. So we have gone through a lot of heavy topics. We've talked about a lot of things. This book does have a lot of big topics. It has a lot mm -hmm. of emotion, has a lot of feeling. Um, but when you think about Aniana, when you think about this book and writing it, what was, What's your best memory, your happiest moment from this book? Mm -hmm. oh my I know that's a big one. No, no, it's it's so I would say that it was when I finished the first draft because it was my birthday. I'm gonna cry. Oh my gosh. It was my birthday weekend and it was oof, I went, yeah, it was, it was yeah, that was November 2020. And so we know 2020, what yeah. 2020 was. Um <laughs> it was November 2020. My husband like sent me away for the weekend. Uh, I got a little Airbnb in Surfside. Um, so I wasn't in Galveston, but I was by the water and I had just committed. I knew I just had like the last few, you know, 20, 30 pages to go. And I was like, I'm going to finish it. And so he just, you know, my daughter was maybe like, I think she just turned three, if I'm not mistaken, maybe just, just 
turned two. Ooh. Anyway, she was a toddler. Um, and he was like, you need to get away. And I was like, yeah, and I want to finish this book. So that was like my birthday, birthday present to myself or he, you know, he gifted that to me. And so I went away and I remember that Saturday night, just like, or actually it was Sunday morning, Sunday morning, I woke up early. I like just typed it out and I finished it. And then I just went and I just like walked by the beach and I was just like, done like you know i knew it wasn't done done but it was like the first full draft was complete and i just was like okay like this you know i did it like thank you you know i like to thank the ocean i thanked all the stars i thanked you know the universe and and i was like i'm i'm you know i, I did it like i wrote i wrote this book and it was my first real you know my first middle grade book my first full fiction novel my first attempt at a novel in verse and so to just have like a completed draft just felt really good and the fact that it was like my birthday weekend you know was just like a a pivotal and wonderful moment for me, um, you know, and and yeah, I think that that was probably like one of the highlights is just like that first completed draft um, after, you know, the months and months of all the things that we as a world had been going through um, to say like, in spite of all of this, like I did it, like I wrote a book, you know, and I wrote this thing and I didn't know what was going to come of it. I was just like, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have, you know, none of that. I it was just like, I just wrote this thing because I needed to get it out of my body, my system. I just wanted to write this thing. And I had plans for like maybe getting an agent, but I didn't really know what the future of the book was going to be, but, but I wrote it and I was just so proud of myself for having done it. And the fact that it was like my birthday weekend and I did it. Um, and I was able to like go to the water and like be near the water, um, you know, to be able to celebrate that for myself was just really meaningful. Um, and I'll say that for every milestone with the book, um, I found a way to like, myself to get back to the water, you know, and to, to be near the ocean, you know, to give thanks and to just be, to be grateful for, for where this book has taken me for sure. Well, and it's so interesting that you wrote it during the pandemic because so many of my favorite books that have come out in the last, you know, several years have been mm -hmm. pandemic novels that people wrote. And it's <laughs> almost like everybody poured so much of more of their hearts and souls mm -hmm. into these books. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're some of the best books I've ever read. <laughs> I mean, Aniana, I love her. I love that she's a Texas gal. I love yeah. that she represents so many important themes and lessons for our, you know, teen tween readers. Yeah. Um, I love that you were by the ocean when you finished your first draft. Yeah. She's, she's, <laughs> she's very special. So I'm glad you got to have that very special moment with her. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so Ani is, of course, on our Spirit of Texas list. Lots of star to reviews. You have your your YA memoir. You have your poetry. Um your poetry book, you have your translating books, you're translating lots of books, um, which is incredible. But what are you working on next for you? Are you allowed to talk about it? Besides little... the play, because that's also awesome. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of things. Yeah, I am, I'm working on another novel in verse. It's a young YA, sophomore, young girl, and it digs into my theater background. So Ooh. she herself is an actress, she's a performer, um, and she's trying to use art as activism. And so she um, is uh, delving into the world of guerrilla theater, which is using theater in open spaces in public spaces, not just in the actual like auditorium, right, like in a theater, um, to, to raise awareness uh, about some issues that she's very passionate about. Um, and so I'm, I'm in the middle of working on that and all of its issues and trying to revise and, and wrap it up so that it can hopefully be out in the world soon. Um, and we've, I've got some picture books in the works, which is all I can say about that, but there are some, some younger picture books uh, in the works. Um, and, and I do have some, some more ideas and early drafts of more middle grade uh, novels. So I, do, I do love the middle grade space and I do hope to, to live there for a little while. Um, but this, this one that I'm working on now, this YA, was actually what I wrote before Aniana, and then I shelved it. I was like, like I wrote it, and then I was like, ah, okay, kind of over it. And then I started writing Aniana, and that's sort of, and that's what came out first. And so, when I was asked to like, what's the next thing you got? I was like, I have this thing that I also wrote during the pandemic. <laughs> like, let's see what it is. But it, it had, you know, it has its issues. So I'm working through that right now. Um, but I'm excited because I do get to kind of delve back into my my theater background um, and use that as as sort of the the center of the story. Yeah. I love that you're writing all over the place from children's books <laughs> to YA, you got memoir, you're translating, yeah. you're narrating audiobooks. I mean, you got a lot going on. <laughs> I do, I do, I do, but I love it all. It uh, keeps me busy, uh, keeps things interesting. Um, you know, I definitely, um, I sort of do miss the regular, like having like a regular quote unquote job, um, but uh, but this is fun. This, like I said, it uh, keeps me on my toes for sure. 
and provides flexibility, not going to lie. I have, I have a much more flexible schedule, so which is nice. That's nice because when inspiration hits, you can do what you yes. need to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that. Well, I have, um, I think, two questions from some readers. Um, so these are middle grade students. These are their questions. So the first one is, would you ever write another book about Aniana and her family? So yeah, I've been asked that several times. Um, again, I won't say never, <laughs> never say never. Uh, as of right now, it's it's not planned. I don't don't have anything planned as far as like a sequel or another book. Um, but I think it might be interesting, perhaps, to follow Ani into high school and see what that's uh, like and and what happens uh, in her journey uh, with her chronic illness and swimming and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Uh, you know, I but as of right now, there's no plans to. I'll say that. Okay. That's fair. You have a lot of projects on. Don't know, so that's <laughs> yeah. okay. We can we can accept that answer. Um, so another one, which I always love when kids ask this of authors, is what are some of your favorite books or books that you recommend for um, after reading Aniana Del Mar? Mm, yeah. So first, I'll answer the first part. Favorite books, because I get this so much. Um, when I th and when I think about like middle grade and young readers, I, I try to give the, the books that I that were my favorite when I was that age. Um, so they're older, um, but The Giver by Lewis Lowry is an all time favorite. Um, and Bridge to Terabithia also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, kind of like my, anyway, uh, my my tastes are a little eclectic or, you know, uh, <laughs> like literary fiction uh, part very much so. Um, and I would say like after reading Aniana, um, I mean, I'm just going to recommend a ton of novels in verse. So I feel like anything by Aida Salazar, um, like Land of the Cranes or The Moon Within, um, are favorites. Um, I also really enjoy um, anything and everything by Jacqueline Woodson. So Brown Girl Dreaming, um, The uh, After, The Ever After. Is that what it's yes. called? Yeah, Before the, the Ever After. Before the Ever After. Yeah. Sorry, Before the Ever After, beautiful book. Um, also, really enjoyed. Um, uh, Starfish by Lisa Phipps, uh, if you're into swimming books as well. Um, and I believe Jerry Craft, no, not Jerry Craft, is that Jerry Craft? There was one about a swimmer, graphic novel. Um, Funny Christmas. It's, okay. Uh, yeah, um, Swim Team. Swim, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, Frizzy by Claribel Ortega, which I translated into Spanish because uh, she's a Dominican main character as well. It's a beautiful book about loving your hair and embracing your natural hair texture. Um, so I think those, a lot of those have connections to, to my book, either as a novel in verse or sort of a Dominican protagonist or swimming, you know, middle grade. All those I think are, are wonderful. Um, and I'm sure there's so many more that I could name. Um, but those are the ones that, that, yeah, that come off the top of my head. Those are great. Those are great suggestions <laughs> for all of those. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because when you, when I asked that question, those are the, some of the first books that popped into my head too. Yeah. Um, that's just, I love that there's writers, authors are writing such great, diverse, unique titles for our middle grade readers. Those, you know, middle grade is an area where kids are figuring out who they are and finding their mm -hmm. passions and you all I mean, especially like Ani, you're seeing a girl whose passions are, you know, unique. And this is a very mm -hmm. Texas centered book. So our, <laughs> you know, Texas readers, yeah. these are, this girl's just like our other girls in Texas who's, mm -hmm. you know, you live in a warm climate, you're swimming, you're, it's the friends, it's the texting, it's all the things going on. Yeah. And it's so important that our middle graders are reflected in books. And this is such a beautiful one for them. And just I was so honored to have you today this has been so much fun um <laughs> thank you for humoring me with my kind of digression from our oh no worries <laughs> we got to talk about some great things that um I think are important concerning your book and like centered around the themes and you know the great stuff that comes out of reading this book um and learning about Ani and learning to find your voice and advocate for yourself so yeah. Um, so thank you for joining me today for this. Yes, thank you for having me for the invitation and just asking such great questions and yeah, really digging into the story because um, yeah, I love talking about it and, and sharing it with readers. So hopefully the, the love continues to get shared around. I'm sure it will. And we can't <laughs> wait for the next thing and to see Ani on stage. That'll be very exciting. To yeah. I'll have to <laughs> keep us posted on that yeah, so we can share sure. that out and make sure that people know, especially our Houston area friends to go and check that out. For sure, will do. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody who has joined us today for our Spirit of Texas Author Spotlight with Jasmine Mendez. Be sure to check out our Spirit of Texas website for book club activities, read alikes, and more for Aniana Del Mar Jumps In and all of our 2024 Spirit of Texas books and authors. 
Stay tuned for our next episode, which will be coming soon to the Texas Library Association's Young Adult Roundtable YouTube channel and to our Spirit of Texas website. And just thank you again, Jasmine, for our time together. This has been so lovely. Thank you. Thank you.